Okay. Hi, I think we're on, Ling. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Sarah Traver. I'm the director here at Traver Gallery, and I'm with Ling Chun, who is our esteem, one of two esteemed <laughs> artists that we're going to be see, talking with tonight. Um, Ling opened a show with us earlier this month titled Missing Moon, mm -hmm. and we're going to walk through the exhibition together and hear about the show and learn about Ling's artistic career and process and <laughs> the inspiration behind the show. Um, but a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, if everybody could please mute their mics and um, feel free to leave your video on if you want or turn it off. We're going to be, we have Deb Spotlit, um, so we should be the big picture on your screen. Um, and then at the end of our walkthrough, um, we will have a few minutes to ask questions about to Ling about her work, if you have any. Um, and then we're going to jump to the other show, which is an incredible show by Jen Ellick and Jeremy Burt. And we're going to walk through that exhibition with Jeremy. And at the end of that, we'll have time for questions as well. So that's sort of the agenda. Yeah, um, that sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. Let's jump in. Um, Ling, thank you so much. This is a really, it's been really fun to have your exhibition in the gallery this month. Um, I think it's, since we're doing this walkthrough at the end, I have learned all of these things about what people are seeing in the work and how they're thinking about it. And um, at least for me as a gallerist, like over the course of the month, you really learn a lot about how to talk about the work and you see so much more in it than when the exhibition just opened. So I feel like I have a totally different perspective yeah. on this show now than I did a month ago. Um, so maybe this conversation will be better than the first time around, but yeah. we'll see. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I would say though, like having the gallery space is such a, you know, a dream for an artist just able to play around with the space and uh, really bringing this whole show together um, is this gorgeous ceiling that you guys are going to experience with the exhibit. And like you say, throughout the month, I also got response from people that who visiting the shows and, you know, the feedback that they gave me, it helps me also to learn what are the perspective they uh, see it through or um, uh, the comments that we have or resonate with them. So, yeah. Uh, it's always equally benefit as an artist, also an audience for you guys to check out the shows. So. As I actually have a question about that. Um, as an artist, do you mm -hmm. enjoy getting that feedback? Or once once you set up a show, have you just kind of released the work into the world and you, you don't I, need the feedback anymore? Uh, I enjoy the feedback. I think the feedback are the most important part or like the driven of why I keep doing those shows because a lot of their work that I'm doing and uh, that is actually involved with a lot of my immigrants experience. Mm -hmm. So actually hearing someone to say that, hey, I, I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Like I understanding this work, what it means, uh, particular to um, all fellow immigrants from Hong Kong or from China who actually might understand some, some pieces that in the exhibit because it's actually uh, indications of a Chinese character of home. And having to hear that back, it's quite important for me as a way to like what it means to resonate with others and what it means as an artist, like what is my role in this world and how do I place it so I can connect with audience. That's awesome. So those are the things that it's like equally very important to yeah. me. Yeah. Also very vulnerable. You know? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, should we walk into the show and take yeah. a look? Absolutely. <laughs> Where should we start, Ling? Uh, I would say I always like to having people walking through uh, kind of around from this angle coming through and then uh, kind of stopping on this one of these main pieces and uh, which was the whole title of Missing Moon, uh, quite a bit much inspired from when I started uh, making this couple pieces. So. Uh, we can start with any of those three pieces that in the centrums of the exhibit. Well, since Deb is the camera focused on this piece, mm -hmm. let's start here. Um, can you, so maybe just to start, can you talk a little bit about the concept of the show mm -hmm. and then 
tell us about this piece specifically? I know there this piece ties into all of these other pieces in a pretty significant yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the exhibit Missing Moon, actually this title came with a lot of struggle and lots of tears and crying just because it uh, very closely um, related to our personal story about uh, my relationship with my family, why my parents are overseas living in Hong Kong and I'm all the way here in the US. And that kind of, uh, um, and within this last two years, I guess everyone experiencing the same way where we try our way to connect in with our family, despite the fact we are away from where our parents are. And that kind of uh, times of really being restricted, not able to visit my parents, kind of coming back to the ideas of like, I miss them. And in the same time, I also miss the ideas of home, but, I have been here in the state for 14 years. Hmm. So the home to me will used to be an easy answer, which would be Hong Kong. But that answer become more and more difficult. Like to, you have, you occupy two I, spaces. Yeah. And in the same time, so I also occupy two identities. And so the complexities of that feeling are kind of the result of the works that you've seen in this exhibit. Um, the word missing moon were actually uh, based on a conversation that I have with my mom where she will send me text message at home in Hong Kong. It's nighttime and it's daytime here in the US. You send me a picture of the moon hmm. and it'll be like, hey, it's full moon tonight. I miss you all. I wish we can come back soon and reunion and have to uh, and look at the moon together. Because oh. that is something that we always do as a family. Like, in our um, Chinese traditionals, moon is the symbol of un reunion and hmm. togetherness. And for me, seeing that picture, seeing my mom sending me the moon, it's at dark and I'm here in the US just like looking at the sky, it's bright. Yeah. So where's my missing moon? Yeah. So that was how huh. the whole show has come together is with that feeling. Um, and particularly, you know, thinking about my role as a immigrants here, there's always, a word to say that once you leave home, home is nowhere, hmm. or once you leave home, home is everywhere. Hmm. So what it is for me right now. So yeah. that's kind of that whole ideas. You can, you know, <laughs> decoding the word missing moon as missing home. Yeah. Or missing the identity, the unity. The, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That mm -hmm. the solidness of that singular place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, so with that in mind, <laughs> tell us what we're looking at here. So uh, the work that you're looking at is my um, reflections of when I drove through I-90s, when I see full moon, that, that full moon will always have that moonlight shining through the whole I-90s on the sound. And the one things I wanted to do, of course, is try to take my pictures. For anybody who doesn't know what that means to cross I-90 in Seattle, it is the bridge that crosses Lake Washington. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's a floating bridge. And so when you cross that at night and you have just this expanse of water on either side of you and the moonlight plays on the surface of the water and it's yeah, really beautiful. It is. And um, so there is that, you know, the sentiments where the moon is here, but oftentimes when I'm driving back home, it's that um, I'm always alone by myself. Mm -hmm. And there's so much of those feeling wanted to share, but not able to share. So that's kind of part of that uh, reflections to coming into this pieces with the blue indications of the water seen through the moonlight mm -hmm. and uh, which each little individual of the ceramics piece that's sticking out with brass tube um, is actually a characters of home. And I've been taking them into a part um, and you will see a gradients of color kind of descending, um, continues actually trying to reaching out to the moon. So each one of these individual elements is mm -hmm. actually part of a calligraphic stroke. Is that? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you've basically taken the Chinese character for mm -hmm. home yeah. and 
basically pulled it apart, yeah. mm -hmm. like exploded it into its individual parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here it is reflected Onto, on the water, on the in, water. The, in the moonlight. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. so beautiful. So it just, you know, the continuations of, you know, I think I don't necessarily in where the culture I grew up in, emotion are quite suppressed. Like, I don't even know how to say I love you in Chinese to my parents. It just wasn't a way we ever grown up with. So having something that is so strong, I know exactly what I need to say in English, but not knowing how to say it in Chinese was kind of part of the struggle where like I see it there, but I just wasn't able to spit it out. So everything become kicking apart. And hmm. so there's also, I think that a lot of uh, people might resonate with it when you're coming up from a different cultures and uh, that kind of affections, we don't necessarily showing through with our language, but we're showing through um, like my mom, she would feed me. Like she mm -hmm. would just like eat, eat, eat. Why are you not eating? You have to eat. So her love language <laughs> food is, is food. food. <laughs> yeah. And I'm still for girl. What is my love language to them? Because mm -hmm. it's been hard to just tell them like how much I miss them. Uh, they would just think that I don't care about them, but which is really sad. And <laughs> so, so kind of like exploring that relationship like once again, and how does this culture where I've been in for the last 14 years, uh, how to show love and how do I show that kind of love again to my parents with the language that we both speak. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that kind of reaching in, yeah. and connecting back. So that's a beautiful. lot of continuations with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. Can we look, um, can we look up? Because <laughs> this is sort of, the center, the, the centerpiece in this room. <laughs> yeah. So the neon work that you're looking at actually are, are also the characters of home in Chinese characters. And uh, again, I'm doing similar thing where I did here, I took in all those stroke apart. And uh, only within a certain angles, you are actually able to see the whole characters mm -hmm. uh, being together. And I think that part of the intention is that home to me, it feel very displacements where they're never necessary all together in the same place, but only a mindset, how I shift it to make them all come in the same place. So despite the fact, it seems to, to a lot of people is a abstract work of line or mark making, but to me, it's a, uh, representation of, of like how I looking for what it means a home again and mm -hmm. how do I expressing through neon which was a medium set you see that a lot in Hong Kong uh, which also disappearing <laughs> so there's you, a lot yeah you talked about mm -hmm. this to me earlier about the the neon light and choosing neon as mm -hmm. a medium to work with because of the Hong, the cityscape in Hong Kong and the prevalence of neon yeah. in that environment. Yeah, yeah. So I would say the last time I visited home was 2017. At that time of the uh, years, mm -hmm. there's still quite a bit. It wasn't as much as like the 60. Uh, but at that time, I can still recognize a few signs where the, those are the street I grew up up with those in the street I will go hang out with my friend in the street uh, but that was the last time I was home and I know that in 2018 the new uh, housing law that have been placed in Hong Kong have uh, forcing a lot of the neon side being taken down uh, so you it's a kind of a fight or thought that I have of like how can I retain that memory of home and through making neon light or even learning the craft of neon light, that was for me of like finding a cruise, a way to keeping those memories that what I have about home in mm -hmm. Hong Kong uh, into tangible objects. Because mm -hmm. I know that next time when I get back home, things are not going to be same. It's not going to feel the same. And at least I keeping those memory and trying to capture as much as possible and bring it in life. So this is a bit of memories and also a souvenir to me about the home that I used to know. Hmm. So yeah, so that's 
a lot of that <laughs> like sentimental yeah. pack into my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it feels appropriate to the last two years that we've had i mean i think a lot of us have had that experience of like yeah. just feeling very deeply these emotions and these longings for yeah. family and home and and certainly for you that is the distance is even greater than it is for most of us and the timeline yeah. even longer um but yeah i think it really resonates for everybody coming out of this pandemic and that feeling of missing yeah. something or remembering things and um and trying to capture it somehow and like yeah. hold on to it in mm -hmm. a way yeah absolutely and that's kind of also you know uh you know in picking of this topic and having a show in the times feels like we're seeing the end of the tunnel, but we don't know yet. <laughs> That's how I feel with everything. So uh, having the shows, I can see a lot of, you know, people were able to resonate, but in the same times, this is also the experience of a lot of immigrants. Mm -hmm. It's not just that two years that we experienced, it's the years when we chose to leave our home, or for some, they don't have a choice. Um, so, you know, those are all kind of something that, you know, I wanted to using this opportunity and the timing and yeah. having people to putting those two um, experience have a relationship with it yeah. to be more empathy of how other people have lived in, in the same place where you are and how do we work commonly with each other. Yeah, that's so, beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's keep looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As Deb's looking around, I just want to point out the shadows that are on the wall that are cast from the neon. That was such a wonderful thing that happened. I would call it a little heavy F. But it's so like, it. I love the way that then that this piece and the language that it represents, like the word that it represents is then projected and abstracted all throughout the room. It's like, yeah really poignant i i i was very happy with the result as i was like installing these pieces and i was like oh wow i love all this line kind of like putting out bits because you know the truth is concept of home is really complex and there's no one way to say what it is or and they change just like if the light shifts everything changed again mm -hmm. and so definitely it was one of my happiest accidents yeah <laughs> for things that i do yeah and um as steph is pointing out this pieces uh you may be able to see the moon on the tiles of the uh underneath with all this little piece and once again those little pieces that you're looking at are also part of the strokes of uh, what I recall, um, they're coming from the Chinese character of home. So this three trials pieces are kind of worked together as, as I want people to looking through this work um, and the structure itself, how I was building it uh, kind of prep up um, is to assimilating the draft table. A lot of times when Explorer drafting a map and um, so it's also one of the device to look for home. Hmm. So that's kind of how, you know, why there's a little level platform happening in here. Uh, of course, it's great for people to look through the entire tiles, but also at the same time, it's also, um, you know, assimilating the ideas of uh, navigating, exploring, as we pointing it through to looking into the neon lights, how the positioning of the pieces in the exhibit, uh, everything is something that I really wanted to take up the space and bring this whole installation together. So, hmm. Yeah. Can you get a little technical for a minute and Absolutely. tell us how you're making these pieces and yeah. like what we're looking at? So like these are all individual little bits of so like <laughs> slip, right? I mean, yeah. it's Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> well, you tell what it is. So I'm gonna... what it does is that, uh, well, each of this little, little individual is actually made with a slip and slip essentially are more kind of like a buttercream of clay. 
in a, in a consistence. So I, I love that. That's like the yeah. perfect description. And so, uh, so you can like move it I like move you would it. move frosting almost. Exactly. So kind of like think about like decorating cupcake, but uh, <laughs> instead of decorating cupcake, I squeeze it in. And uh, when I was young, I was actually went to school and to do a lot of calligraphy during summer school. We talk about seven and eight. And um, so all the stroke that you're looking at, it's the myself remembering practicing a stroke with you know ink and brushes and how I making those each individual pieces and uh and really is is that I'm having this um kick decoration bed filled up with slip and I will just squeeze it and then as I squeeze it my body will move around with the strokes and kind of like bringing in those memory of practicing from seven in the morning to I don't remember it was late, <laughs> just like eight hours per day, just practice just one stroke, getting it all perfect. Is that common? That yeah, it's very common. <laughs> kids in China will have to do calligraphy I, courses like that and like well, learn. I would say that was a extracurricular classes okay. during summer times okay. for summer school because you know we're all just running around, not doing anything. And my mom's like, you need some discipline. Let's take you to Kalifagu school. And I was like, uh, okay. And yeah, and you might noticing a lot of my work involved with the concept of grip. And that is actually the way how calligraphy works, where when we practice, we all have this grid that we work with. Hmm. And each of the stroke almost have its own life of how it harmonies with the other stroke. So then overall, the character looks um, unified and balanced. Uh, so, so that's kind of like, you know, why groups, you know, their concept of grids or square, uh, always existing in my work. Interesting. For most of my recent work. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, I, have you ever thought about how that practice inform, I mean, obviously conceptually it informs your work a lot. Yeah. Do you think that that practice as a kid sort of informed your own development as an artist? I think for somewhat, I think it definitely is. Like I think growing up was as a kid, I have always been, my mom has always been like, go to art school, uh, take us to drawing class. And then uh, I just end up developing, always developing interest in art. Uh, just never really know like, is this really what I wanted to do? But just like, oh, I love it. I have fun. And in fact, I did terrible. My brother and sister actually did really well, but none of them really chosen the path of art, uh, which it's, I think was kind of a surprise for my parents too. Hmm. It's like, oh, well, we got an artist from our family, <laughs> which I hope they're proud of me. <laughs> I think they're proud of me. Well, we only, we should keep looking around because I want to make sure we see all the pieces in the show. Yeah. We can talk while we look. Yeah, so this piece is you guys looking at is actually made during 2020s. So kind of in the peak of pandemic and uh, going through the period of uh, 2019 to 2020, that was the period where um, Hong Kong going through a upheaval of demographics and where there's a lot of change. And that's again, the ideas of like wanting to preserve the home that I remember and bring it into a pieces like that. And again, the grip system that I was talking about how it was influenced from uh, the calligraphies and all shows up here again, um, just kind of going back to more political contents with that is that a lot of China, uh, Hong Kong has always been using traditional Chinese uh, with the return to China in 1997s, uh, slowly things has been changing, uh, including some language that you might see in a lot of government website or sometimes school, uh, they're implemented to learn simplified Chinese. So having these two language coming together where in the same time I was trained to know how to do calligraphy in traditional Chinese. And now, what does that mean when I have to switch to simplify? How do I blend those two different language? Um, well, they are essentially the same language. How do I find harmony with something that was unfamiliar? So that was also part of uh, the work and the pieces with the neon lights. 
uh, and the structure have a lot to talk about those neon size structure that often you will find it in Hong Kong, the way how sign structure extended out and the materials uh, with the pine wood um, resonate a lot during 2020 when protests happening in town, lots of business have poured up and uh, that was become the materials. It feels very intuitively to be using at that time of my period when I'm hmm. making this work. Yeah. Yeah. How about the moon jars? The moon jars. Yes. These so, are so beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, the moon jar, it's the extensions of uh, thought process. When I working with, um, when I thinking through the three pieces that we were talk early on in the exhibit, those are the moon jar that I was making as I thinking the relationship of um, Hong Kong and Seattle. And that ideas of my relationship with my parents, the day and night. So you might see noticing some of the jars, uh, they kind of come in pairs where one have a darker colors and one have a lighter colors and the other one just kind of reverse. So those are kind of those like, I'm thinking about that relationships a lot. And one thing great about ceramics as a medium is that it's a craft. And one of the things that with times and process, often the ideas come through. So those are, I would say, uh, the sketch of the pieces that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then with this whole set of nine pieces actually were represent date and night for again, the time zone and uh, the number of nine came through because the stroke, the character stroke of home is have a nine strokes in it. So that's a lot of like numbers kind of come make sense to me. I don't necessarily intend to representing that as a strokes, but uh, as I thinking through all of this work that I'm making, um, it become makes sense why subconsciously the number nine becomes so prompts to a lot of my work in, uh, in the pairing, the concept of pairing also comes through uh, with all this little moon jar. <laughs> and uh, with a little historical background, if you don't know, a lot of trade, the moon jars that came from a traditional uh, Korean uh, ceramics where they will throw two bowls and connecting them. And that line of connections are quite important because it's also reassemble the concept of reunions and togetherness. <laughs> so it tied back to what I was making. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of like undertone meaning. Do you throw these in two parts and connect them or are they thrown as one? No, they throw it as one. <laughs> Maybe in the future. <laughs> I would do that with a bigger piece. Can you talk, I mean, as we approach this other sculptural piece here, can you talk a little bit about your use of color and materials and how you think about that and, and why you choose to include the materials that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So this piece is, it's more of our early work that you guys are looking at where colors are heavily involved with textures and also including some inconventional materials like hairs that you will see on the side. And uh, the choice of this uh, inconventional materials like hair into ceramics um, as a lot of part where I'm thinking a lot of my identity of removing myself from the home where I grew up in and then coming to this country, it's also feel like I'm gaining a identity, um, not necessary to the identity that we're following me through from the place where I grow, but it feels like I was able to recreate who I am. Mm -hmm. So similar way of having to seeing the hair coming through my work, it's um, to me, it's extensions of glaze kind of pushing out from the surface of ceramics and extend it out to a different dimensions. Uh, so when I inserting hair into the work, um, I feel like giving a new life and identity to hair not just limited to what we see in the head of our head, but <laughs> something else, something yeah. new. Yeah. And generally, I just love color. Yeah, that's very clear. <laughs> you yeah. see these, 
it's interesting because I think as somebody who doesn't know your background and <laughs> is coming uninformed into the space as you approach these pieces, there is such a sense of like spontaneity and like joy and playfulness yeah. to them, which mm -hmm. is also a characteristic that I think you have in the world, <laughs> even though I think the last few years have been challenging, when, yeah. but, um, but that's certainly a spirit that you bring to your work. And Thank you. it's fun to have the work in the gallery. Yeah. Um, let's quickly take a look at this last piece and then we'll jump um, over to questions briefly. Sounds good, yeah. Uh, so this piece is, if you're coming into the angle from the center, and backing out, uh, you're noticing it's somewhat symmetrical, like a mirror effect where the center line of the pieces, uh, as you're backing out, you see that it's just reflecting on the other side. Hmm. It's, a piece, it's, it's a piece of, um, I made it because I really wanted to think about what it means of like, to create something that we're longing for. And I think that for most people, a good analogy is to think about is during the two years of pandemics, how much of us have tried to create home office, virtual happy hours, um, you know, or like virtual wedding, try to assimilating the similar ideas or effect that, you know, we're longing for. And, you know, there is part where there's excitement when I making this piece is that I can see the mirroring kind of comes together, but there's also disappointment where it's like, it just isn't the same. So that was also the part that uh, I hope people, when they're looking through, they realize, oh, it is a mirror, but there's some part isn't really exactly the same. And uh, that's also part of like the idea of searching for home um, how can I make things more home-like and what does that even mean when to make my home look homey and all that, you know? So that was, this piece is how it came through of that decisions, why I want things to be reflecting uh, from each to an other pairings. So, yeah. Thank you, Ling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It was really fun to walk through the exhibition with you. Yeah. Um, and it's been so much fun to have the work in the gallery. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for the opportunity and the space. It's yeah. a wonderful and beautiful space. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I could talk to you for another 30 minutes. Maybe we should just do it again sometime. Okay, I'll okay. love to do that. <laughs> um, and I am going to switch over and introduce you all to Jeremy. And we're going to see this other incredible exhibition. See you guys. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We we only get Jeremy tonight. Unfortunately, Jen was not available this evening, but yeah, she's um, at home watching. Though. She's at home watching. So Good. Hi, Jen. Say the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Jeremy is one half of the artist duo who created this incredible exhibition. Jeremy Burt, um, Jen Ellick. And you guys have been friends and in our community for a very long time. Yeah, we've and, been in Seattle since about 96. Yeah, um, and have exhibited in various capacities in this gallery mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, whether your shows or other people's shows, your hands have been yeah, in this space really definitely. a lot. Yeah. But this is the first time we've done a show like this with so much of your neon work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's really exciting to yeah. see. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, Absolutely. it's been great. To, it's been great to show in this space too. Usually we're showing in the um, in the other space. So it's yeah. kind of nice. One of the things about this space and this show is that it's been so fun is the reflections of the neon in the windows. Um, that's one of Neon's uh, superpowers is the uh, reflection in adjacent uh, glass. Yeah. Um, so we see all these uh, forest friends in the trees. Totally. And I don't think any of us really anticipated that. We, we knew not to the like not to the extent that it, it that it is as has happened. It yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, when we planned the show, we thought. It, great to do it out in the space to yeah. really let the neon do what it does best and yeah. act as kind of 
a beacon to the outside world and mm -hmm. draw attention in here and yeah and um, to use the neon in not a dark space I yeah mean, it stands up just great in the full daylight you know it's uh it's very powerful uh, light source yeah but the the animals reflected in the tree in particular the owl sitting in the branches yeah. is, is awesome yeah. and i don't know if that's going to come through on the camera really well or not but yeah. um we i hope folks we got some good photos and those yeah. are on instagram and things so yeah. i hope people check it out um jeremy can you tell the title of the show is illuminated forest yeah can you so it's it's basically um a diary of our pacific northwest experience um rendered in this material that we learned about in art school and have continued to study since then um so the uh, how we work is very um analog should it's we walk over and, and see pencil. some yeah um jenny will uh pick the subject and produce a paper pencil drawing full size of of the piece and then i take her drawing and using pencil and eraser turn it into a neon pattern and then i bend it or friends of ours bend them and then um any fabricates this uh metal frame um, out of cold rolled steel. Um, she's an uh, accomplished um, fabricator. And um, we've chosen this uh, beer sign format for these pieces um, because for a number of reasons, um, one of them being it works so well and it's been developed over, you know, the past hundred years or whatever of, of neon being used um, in in advertising and um it's a just a great marriage of of glass and steel mostly in these pieces it's just glass and steel and uh um the 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 metal framework does such a great job of supporting the neon and providing something to mount the transformers to so it's a it's a system that has been developed um, over the years and it works great. And so it's kind of a, our homage to uh, his, the, some of the history of, of neon. Yeah, one of the things that you guys have talked a lot about and that I think is, um, I've really enjoyed about this exhibition and kind of learning about your process is how you think about the craft, the, the sort of traditional craft of neon yeah. its function in the world the yeah. role of the people who made it yeah and like and then bringing that in like recontextualizing it and reusing it to yeah to... using that powerful tool of advertising this this the these this tool that's been developed for advertising and redirecting that energy uh to something that we love which is nature and in the pacific northwest um, we have all sorts of opportunities to uh, commune with nature. And so all these, um, these are our forest friends and they are, um, you know, uh, birds that we see outside of our kitchen window or um, slugs that we try not to step on when we're <laughs> hiking or mushrooms that we're looking for in the woods. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to realize this dream and and uh, to see and to see it uh, come together like this. The scale of these pieces is really amazing too. Yeah, I mean these are they got bigger and bigger. <laughs> like the, the owl was a later one, and it it it's uh, the bigger you could you you can draw, the more detail you can get. This fawn is actually uh, some pretty amazing detail in a small a small format so um that's i've been pleased with uh that piece as far as um we're drawing with a uh basically a half inch fat line so um it's it can be kind of tricky to get the detail you need to uh to render uh the, what we're trying to represent 
we've also learned how to airbrush um, the neon. We learned this from our friend Grant Gullickson. Grant um, was is a glass bender, um, and he, well, he just recently retired, but um, he's been a great friend, a great resource for um, technique, and and he showed us how to use an airbrush to uh, to paint on the tubes. Uh, we kept needing browns and blacks when we wanted to make animals, and so that was a that was a stumbling block at, to try to figure out how to represent these animals um, when there's no brown and black neon. <laughs> yeah, well, and so for those people who might be on the call who are not familiar with how neon really works, so some of the color in these pieces is actually yeah. in, is in the gas itself, right? Yeah. Like it's using different- Yeah, we should look at my circle piece and um, we can talk about the colors. Um, there's a few different ways we get the different colors. Um, we call it neon, but all these pieces are actually filled with argon mercury gas. And um, that gives you this steel blue color that you can see right here in the electrode. That color right there is from the mercury in, in the tube. Okay. Um, so the plasma discharge, the, you call that plasma, the light in there. And that, uh, that color is from the mercury. And then um, there's colored glass here, like this is yellow glass. So with the yellow glass and, and the that blue, blue light shining through it, you get that antifreeze color. Um, and then there's clear, clear gas or clear glass with, uh, <laughs> with a, a layer of phosphor uh, on the inside. Phosphors are rare earth minerals that glow when they're exposed to um, ultraviolet light. And uh, so a lot of these are clear glass uh, with this powder on the inside, just like a light bulb or a fluorescent lamp would have, but that's how you get some of these lighter colors. So, sorry, explain in the piece like this. So then you have, this is essentially one tube, one tube yeah. and you are fusing these yeah. tubes of glass together that have different color properties, different yeah. properties that are going to allow that to show different colors. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so this is so this is a technique I developed during COVID shutdown um, when I had lots of time in my studio to uh, to uh, free from any sort of con constraints as far as like things I had to do or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was a nice time to be able to concentrate and um, I developed a technique for for welding just random colors. I picked these colors randomly and um, it's sort of tricky sometimes to weld different kinds of glass because if you work with glass, you know that the different colors have different properties in the torches. And so they, they heat differently. And what I learned to do was to make the seal and then to come back and jump on either side of the seal with the heat and assess the two different colors for which one needs more heat. And in doing that, I was able to uh, make one weld after another pretty successfully. And um, I had a lot of fun in this work thinking about these different colors as different individuals and thinking about the importance of, of working with who you randomly get uh, placed with um, and working on uh, developing strong bonds with your immediate neighbors hmm. as and 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 that being a way of making um, the whole thing work or so life work. yeah I right it's like a metaphor analogy. for like community yeah, like this is yeah. how we should yeah engage with each other working like together with find the, the way to make those bonds yeah, actually function yeah work together yeah. with the people who are right next to you because mm. you can't control the people that are on the other side of the circle you know <laughs> you can only really relate with who you randomly get put next yeah to. 
Yeah, I mean, that's so true. And it's such a beautiful expression in this it, piece. I love really that. It's really fun. It's a, really the, a, an artist's dream when a simple studio practice, because this is just seals. Uh, it's the most basic move for, for neon fabrication. But when a simple studio practice results in such a visually stimulating piece and also has this pretty obvious uh, social relevance, it's like an artist's dream. So it's just been, it's been really fun. And it's like all I want to do anymore <laughs> is just seal yeah. glass together. Um, I, I think we should take a quick look at maybe Jen's work yeah, here as well. Yeah, this is so, and just real quick before I let you jump in there, um, for the folks who have joined us on here on this call. So most of the work that is in this show is collaborative work between you and Jenny. Yeah. Um, and then there are a handful of pieces that are Jenny's and a handful of pieces. Well, one piece that is yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, so these, this glass piece with the beautiful green powder coated stand, this is Jenny's and it's a piece called Persephone. Yeah. And I'll let you it's a Speak it's a, a totem bit. to femininity it's um it's it's about the, the power of, of woman i think yeah. it um women and it's glass and women glass blowers are a rarity historically and still are and and that's this and they are in neon too um for no reason other than just our society so anyways this is like this is a, a monument to, uh, to, to women. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah, so Jenny's a super skilled fabricator, glass worker. This is the uh, hot made in the in the hot shop. You know, it's not cast, and she fabricated this uh, stand out of steel. And and we just love the way the light is manipulated by the glass um it's just like i mean glad when you see glass like that just doing what glass yeah. does best yeah just it's plain so glass. Yeah, it's just like, like so ice. satisfying yeah. the optics the way yeah. things are the like optics, i mean and yeah. in here where you've got all of this neon in here like yeah you walk around and you see these little miniature versions of all of the neon yeah. pieces so it in this piece or magnified versions of them depending how you're looking through the glass yeah it's yeah it's a lot really of fun. fun and then there's these color studies that she does um uh jenny thinks about color a lot and um in these pieces she had come home from an alpine visit and these are colors that were fresh in her mind from um uh alpine uh trip and um so jenny it's, it's color is super important to her the relationship to the uh but be, be, that is between the different colors um uh so yeah they it's i love that these are like the a natural color palette Right, yeah. these are all yeah. colors that are found in yeah. the Pacific Northwest yeah. in nature, yeah. and yet you take them out of that context and you put them in a gallery, and they are so wildly contemporary. Yeah, like totally. I mean, they. I feel Definitely. like you, you know, these are. It's a color study. It's incredible, yeah. and um, but the title, I love that that just immediately places you back in that environment. Yeah. It's like yeah, and once you yeah, once you understand it as a alpine study mm -hmm. then you see though you understand like yeah those are alpine colors you know those are like colors you see in it's, the mountains um it's not easy too to put colors next to each other oh in a God. way yeah she's in like, which yeah, they she's like vibrate very, and are active she's very very concerned about that when she's making these pieces and i just i'm slightly colorblind so i come at my thing from a completely different avenue and so when I see her like um, really thinking about these colors, I'm just like, oh my God, I can't believe like, like, like red and green next to each other is automatically Christmas, right? So, and, and there's things like that that just are very important to her um, 
so uh, she thinks a lot about the color. And it's yeah. interesting, like, because I'm think I'm not, I don't care about color, but we, and we yet end they're both so successful. That are like almost the same thing. I know it's really cool. That's really cool. Let's um let's walk down here and take a look more at some of the neon pieces. We only have about like five more minutes before we should jump on to questions. Um, and I just I know folks want to be able to see all the work that's in this show. There's this a, lot so, of critters. a lot of critters. <laughs> Yeah, the crow, the pine cone. That's the pine cone. You can't really see it on the camera too good, but that's some pretty intricate bending there. That's Incredible. Good a little nut hatch. Nut hatch. Yeah. See, this is like to my eye, I this pink is is hard to distinguish from the other from the other colors. But when I really look, I can see. The pink belly of the nut to hatch. It's but, subtle, but yeah. I love that about yeah, it. Yeah. I think um, you guys have achieved um, such a like. What do I? How? What's the right way to say this? Like there, the stroke that you. I mean, it, almost like a drawn line or yeah. like well, a painterly yeah, stroke with the know, color, and yeah. it's um, you know neon tends to be so graphic that's its yeah, function and, rigid um, and, yeah. and these have such a Organic. softness to yeah. them yeah yeah it's you know we just like i said we draw these with paper and pencil there's no yeah. computer involved at all <laughs> and uh we take great pride in that because um the whole world has gone so computer -y, you know it's like it's fun to uh to realize that things are still made by hand and and to see that evidence of, of the hand in the work is, is refreshing to us. Yeah, it's, you know, it's so evident in this work. And then what's interesting for me is now I go out into the world yeah. and have a whole new appreciation for neon, for neon yeah. and the signage Every that surrounds us. Every neon tube that you see out there was made by hand. Yeah. Like somebody formed it to a flat pattern. They didn't bend it up tip. I mean, there's some like production beer signs, I guess, that where they use molds and stuff, but but really like most of the neon you see, or all the neon, essentially all the neon you see out there was was made by hand. Yeah. By uh, by skilled labors. And, I know. And I think that that's something that is has fueled the sort of resurgence of, in, of interest in the material is that people are realizing it's made by hand and then it's and then it becomes something so much more precious and it fits into these uh, craft school um, formats and, and, and understandings of, of, um, of material in that um, it's a skill that you have to develop. It's very, it's not easy to do and you have to do it over and over again before you really can do it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I think, um... It's interesting that you said that about like why there is this resurgence in neon and what that interest is. And I, one of the things that I've been thinking about as we've had this show here is the quality of the light yeah. and how we're all in front of our computers, yeah. in front of this blue under LED light lights. under LED lights, yeah. surrounded by flashing billboards and yeah. signage that yeah. is so much LED, is, a lot of LED, and the stuff. quality of that light is so different. different. Yeah. Um, whereas neon has even the white neon yeah. has even a warmth cool to colors. it, yeah. like and it the way it bleeds out and it like. Yeah occupies space in a different yeah. way whereas the led is so fi yeah, yeah it's so finite yeah um, totally yeah neon is wonderful to live with when you bring it off of the sign and into the living space it becomes something completely different it's it's very much alive it i i love to think of it as uh alive like yeah. we take this empty glass tube and we fill it with life and it's warm it interacts with the environment and uh yeah it's very much um alive yeah so that's that's the fun fun aspect of it it is yeah it is um let's see maybe we can just do a quick spin and then we'll jump on to questions here this raven is one of my favorite pieces in the show and it's interesting because 
I think the way that you, to get that black line, yeah. to have to airbrush the whole front of it yeah. black, yeah. and then all you see is the that light projecting onto the onto wall the behind. Wall. Yeah. It, it's really- Yeah, it's a fun way to work. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a technique that's not unique to us. I mean, it's, it's a lot of artists are arriving at this and um, it's effective though, but we've learned how to leave some white on the mm -hmm. edges to sort of, to really sort of highlight that, that dark line. Um, that's, that's some of the stuff that's cut possible with the airbrush because you can really, you can really lay it in there uh, just how you want it very delicately. So Jenny takes, Jenny does all that airbrushing she really does a lot of this work. She doesn't do the actual glass bending, but but other than that, she's very much responsible for a lot of this work. And 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 this piece here is cool. This is a this is this, such a cool piece. Yeah, this is like a viewing station. We think of this as like a, as a as uh, like the telescope that you walk up to yeah, at the at like, the viewpoint, yeah, and like. <laughs> you put a quarter in and, yep. and then you can look out to, to, at the world. And um, it's been so much fun to see the neon reflected in this little chunk of glass that Jenny made. And, and, and Jenny um, cold worked that lens in there. So she was very, felt very accomplished having, having cold worked the glass uh, with that nice lens. It's so beautiful. And I mean, well, Jen's an amazingly accomplished glass artist. Mm -hmm. she is. Really one of the best in the field. So not surprising that she's doing that work, but it's fun to see it so simple, like that restraint yeah. to not, not yeah. do the decorative or virtuoso yeah. and just let the glass let, be let, the yeah, glass. Absolutely. Is really yeah. Look, using the powers of the glass, the reflective and uh, re refractory yeah. qualities of the. Uh, How did you? I mean, so you guys have been working, you have been working together since college, right? Or yeah, we met in the early 90s at Alfred University. Um, and that's where you got introduced to neon too, yeah, right? Yeah, we learned with Fred uh, Cheetah. Yep, Fred Cheetah taught us about luminous phenomenon hmm. and um, taught so many people about lum luminous phenomenon, Fred did. And, uh, and Jenny did glass blowing at Alfred and did welding and got welding jobs on this in the summertime. She worked at like in a dumpster factory and stuff. And so Jenny was like painting and doing glass work in school. And I was in the ceramic department and uh, in the neon department. Wow. So between the two of us. And you guys are all doing all of that. Yeah, we still. have all that stuff at home. That's now. amazing. Yeah. Like your so, studio space, there's uh, some some wheels, there's a yeah. like Slip all, casting, totally. there's a whole metal fabrication. Jenny's got her MIG and TIG welders and and then there's the neon shop. You just need so. to build a hot shop in the backyard yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Levi's going to bring his uh, mobile shop and park it in the driveway. Perfect. Then, we'll then you're set. <laughs> glass blowing is just so expensive. It's just like crazy to have your own glass yeah. shop. You really have to have a, a product or something going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have to say, Jeremy, it has been really special to have this work in the gallery Thank and you. to. Yeah. Um, and in particular, to like learn about how you and Jen approach making work and thinking about, I mean, I feel like you have such a, a warm and like open perspective to thinking mm. about how, how you make work, but also how the community engages with it and how it sure. reflects what is happening in the broader world. And mm -hmm. I think that that, um, you know, these can all be standalone beautiful pieces, but they actually, the story behind them is so much more than that. Mm, and um, I just think that that's really important and yeah. I applaud you guys. It's really been special. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you very the, much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's yeah. been.
been great to see the work in such a nice space. Yeah, I'm going to be sad to see it go. <laughs> so for anybody who's in Seattle and can make it in in the next two days, these shows are up for just two more days. Yeah, um, I'll but be here on Saturday afternoon if you want to come and yeah, talk about Neon. Please do. About two o'clock-ish. Um, and then we'll, of course, have these videos up on our website. Um, there's a whole page dedicated to these exhibition walkthroughs, so they'll yeah. live there in perpetuity. And um, anyway, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jen. Um, and we will see you all soon. Hope to see you in the gallery sometime. Bye. Bye.